just for our uh, discussion panel tonight. We're going to be looking in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, and we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 30. Uh, very interesting passage there in the uh, life of the Apostle Paul. And uh, so verse 22 and 23 we'll have connected together. It says, and now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me. And what a great uh, well, a couple of verses here in reference to the Apostle Paul's uh, life and how the Spirit of God was directing him. Pastor Duan is on vacation, so we have a substitute here. Tommy's going to fill in for him, bringing all his theological wisdom to us. So, Tommy, why don't you start us off tonight? Uh, well, this, this passage is interesting. I, I, I love the book of Acts. I love the story of the Apostle Paul. And here he's talking about going to Jerusalem to preach the word, and he knows the chances that, you know, things, he knows what's going to happen. He knows that they're going to reject him. He knows that the, the gospel may not be accepted by the majority, but he's still willing to go. And that's what really that what strikes me there is he said, I'm ba I go bound by, in the spirit under Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit, like, he was impressed with the Holy Spirit greatly to go to Jerusalem here, and he just needed to preach the gospel, preach the truth there. And if you look at the next several chapters, which obviously we're not going to really get to tonight, in the book of Acts, the amount of times before kings, before leaders, before preachers, that Paul gets to preach the gospel because he goes to Jerusalem is incredible. Agrippa, we talk, there's, we talk of Festus, Felix, all these men that were completely pagan in their beliefs that get the opportunity to hear the gospel preached mm -hmm. and proclaimed without fear at all by the apostle Paul because he chose to go, because he chose to follow the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Following the Holy Spirit may not always be the easy path, but it's always the right one. And God always knows what's going in front of us. And I think it's very interesting. The Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit had showed him what was going to happen, but he still, he still chose, in spite of those things, in spite of the fears that may have been inside of him, to go as the Spirit commanded him to. Amen. Pastor Petro, do you want to add this? Yeah, I just I love the first part of the, the first verse in twenty sorry, the second part of verse twenty two. It says, Not knowing the things that shall befall me there. So really he was he just you see Paul's burden here, just the fact that he had a burden for the loss and you know, I think of the book of Acts is really just you know the transitional book going into the, the new church age that you know Christ is going to establish and he said, I will build my church and we know that you know that when the Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and all the people got saved and Many times in the book of Acts, you'll see that it says, you know, the people were multiplied, and then that were saved were added. And so there's just a lot of people getting saved, getting baptized, mm -hmm. and getting added to the church. And you can see that Paul is just on fire and he's ready to do it, no matter what is going to come in front of him. Like like he says, I, I know I don't know what things that shall befall me there. He's pretty much saying, I have no idea what could happen or what's going to happen to me. I, you know, I'm sure he's you know had ridicule and persecution in the past, and he knows that it'll be in the future, but he doesn't care. He knows that, you know... The cause of Christ is worth it. You know, I think of David when he says, is there not a cause? And, and Paul knew that, and he took that to heart and says, hey, i got to tell people how to get saved no matter what. You know, and we here in America have religious freedom. We can tell people with no consequences. You know, someone may slam the door, and someone may be a little bit mean to you. I know last Saturday I was out with uh, Brother Mike, and the guy was <laughs> he was doing his front lawn. I was like, hey, can I invite you to church? He's like, no, I'm working. I was like, okay. But, I mean, that's pretty much about it is what's going to happen to you if you go out. Someone may be a little rude to you. Paul knew that he could be persecuted and put in prison. He just went out anyway. So let you know, let nothing stop us from telling other people about Christ, from being a witness. Because, you know, it, it really is the most important thing that they can ever hear. And heaven and hell are in the balance. And you, you give them a chance to be saved. They may not get saved. They may be rude to you. But there may be somebody out there. As uh, they used to tell us at college, you're looking for somebody who's looking for God. Mm -hmm. You know, you, yes, okay, someone's going to reject you, okay, you know, wipe the dust off your feet, but go to the next person. Because yep. that next person may be looking for mm -hmm. God, and you were just sent there mm -hmm. to talk to them. So be a witness no matter what is in front of you. Amen. So I, I just identified these two verses, verse 22 and 23, as a sure direction. And when you have a sh uh, assurance in your heart that God is leading you, it doesn't matter what's in front of you. Because uh, God makes a way for us. You know, Paul, in verse 20, he said, How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. And so 
uh, Paul was bound in the spirit to continue making sure that he was giving the believers everything they needed to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but uh, he was willing to, to not hold back anything that was profitable for the lost, for them to come to know who Christ is. I just like how he says he was bound in the spirit. And, uh, and uh, sometimes, you know, I, I know about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I know about the power of the Spirit. I understand the Spirit is our teacher. And I know under, he's our comforter. I understand all those things. But can I truly say I'm bound in the Spirit? Uh, and oftentimes we're not willing to surrender to that point where we are so connected with the Spirit of God uh, that we absolutely do not hesitate the leading of God in our life. We're bound in the spirit. And then he's, he was unsure of the future because he says in verse 22, not knowing the things that shall befall me. And, uh, and it's interesting. I've, I've talked to a lot of different people over the years and I've had people say, well, if I could just know what God's going to do, well, you're not going to know what God's going to do. And uh, that's not walking by faith. That's walking by sight. And so he, he was bound in the spirit uh, because he was unsure of the future, but he was confident of the adversary. He was aware of the fact that there were adversaries waiting for him. And uh, he knew what it was to be in prison, Acts chapter 16. He's flown in, thrown in the Philippian jail. And uh, certainly he understood what it was to be locked up. But in that process, he also understood how God could get him out of jail. And so he said, I don't know what the future holds. Other than this, I'm confident in the fact that there's going to be adversaries. And there's always going to be adversaries. Anytime you try to do something <clears throat> for God, you're always going to have to overcome obstacles. And so uh, you can do that if you're bound in the spirit. So assured direction. Then on uh, verse 24 and 25, I, I identify these two verses as a positive approach. Notice in verse 24, he says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dearer than myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify of the gospel of grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Positive approach. Pastor, why don't you start us out there? Yeah, I just think right away, just going back uh, to the first part of 24, it says, none of these things move me. You know, that's going right along with the previous verse when it says that, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, I'm going to go for it. And I just think that's a, a great thought that we should have. You know, nothing is going to move me from witnessing to somebody. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to move me from preaching the gospel, from handing out a tract. You know, I think that in my own life, and I probably in your life too, it's just, you know, we're moved by things that shouldn't move us. It's like, oh, well, you know, I, that person doesn't look very nice. I'm not going to give them a track. Or I woke up with a headache today. I don't think I don't think I'm going soul winning. Or I worked late last night. You know, whatever it may be, we can come up with all the excuses. But Paul was determined. You know, none of these things move me. I'm going to witness to whoever it may be. And I thought, you know, and Paul says, I get a lot less of the luxuries that we have today. You know, anywhere he went, he had to walk or, you know, take an animal, whatever it may be. It would have been him very difficult for him to soul win all day and then go to the next church and then go to the next town. You know, but, you know, we, would, we don't think of all that and find his own food. And, you know, it probably wasn't easy to raise support back in those days when he's the one starting all the new churches in the world. So, I mean, none of those things moved him. He just pushed through all the adversity and all the obstacles. And we need to have that same, you know, mindset. You know, hey, I'm not going to be moved if you, if you don't like what I'm saying. Or I'm not going to be moved if you're going to be rude to me. No, I'm going to preach the gospel because why? Because, you know, he's, he said at the end of the verse that it's the gospel of the grace of God. And he knows that it's going to change people's lives. The Jews that he's witnessing to here I have a very works mindset. You know, they're mm -hmm. thinking of the yeah. law and how they're going to work their way to heaven. They have these sacrifices and Paul's like, no, it's God's grace yeah, right. that's going to save you. And he yeah. just has this this fervor that he's going to go and tell them and nothing is going to move him. Amen. Tom, you got something to add there? So, yeah, verse 24 to me is one of the, one of the more awesome verses in the Bible and it's the fact that he, he it was said before, he has no idea what could happen. I mean, People are telling him, well, you're going to get in prison. You're going to get thrown in jail. You're going to get killed. All these things could happen to you. He goes, none of that moves me. None of that, none of that changes my position because my goal is to finish my course, my plan, whatever God has for me with joy. And what is that goal? What's that, that, that course? Is that end of ministry which I have received in the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. 
And he wanted to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. That was his goal. That was his mission. And he needed to preach the gospel in Jerusalem. He was bound in the spirit to go there. And, you know, you th I think about the, the next verse when it talks about this is the last time he was going to see the people from Ephesus that he preached to. This, this town had been completely transformed by that gospel. You, you read some of the things that went on in that town. It was not a godly town when Paul first got there. Mm -hmm. The things that went on in the false, the false goddesses that they had there, the temples, the pagan worship. It was, it was terrible, but the gospel had transformed them. And he's saying, look, I need to go finish that. I need to go finish it. I'm not done, but you know, I, I need to go finish that with joy. He was excited for what was next. As Christians, we, we never need to get down. We never need to get upset. It's not a, you know, a, a coasting to the finish line. It's not a, you know, a drag my feet to the finish line. I, I, I always think of a lot of things that I do in life in, in terms of sports. That's something I enjoy. It's something I love. And, you know, one sport I really love playing is baseball. And when we were growing up, we were little kids. My dad used to coach us. And he would always say, when you're running to first base, you run through that base. Do not slow down. Don't, don't, don't stop as you're getting to the base because that could make the difference between you being safe and out. Well, in our Christian life, that's not how we should approach our Christian life. We need to run through the finish line. We need to go as hard, as fast as we can with all the energy that God gives us until we're done. Amen. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. He goes, my life, it's not, it doesn't matter it, it doesn't. It does not matter. You look at the epistles and the things. The Apostle Paul's life was not what he thought of. He thought of pleasing Christ. He thought of knowing Jesus Christ more. And so, because of that, he was able to go through all the trials he went through with that joy that he was talking about. Amen. So, we certainly see a very positive approach to the ministry that Paul had and the leading of the Spirit of God in his life. First of all, just because he was steadfast, that's why he said, "But none of these things move me." And uh, years ago, it was quite a few years ago, just going through a trial and a difficulty uh, in my life, I came across this verse, and, and God impressed it on my heart. You know, what what do you allow to stop you from going on for serving Christ? And uh, what will stop? What are you uh, willing to allow to stop you from reading your Bible or from praying? And, uh, well, you know, well, I'm tired, or I'm busy, or i got this going on, or so-and-so's mad at me. Uh, wait a minute. None of these things uh, will move us. We keep our course. We keep moving ahead uh, because God has something he wants us to accomplish. That's why Paul said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. Why? Because he said, none of these things move me. I'm not going to let anything stop me from uh, uh, fulfilling the call of God in my life. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something bad. And uh, it, it, we, can, we can end up seeing our life ruined because of the fact that we get involved in something good, but it's not the course that God wants us to complete. So we need to be steadfast. Now put down here, uh, dead to self. He said, uh, neither count I my life the earth unto myself. And uh, so if we're willing to die to self, it's easy to stay the course. If it, if it really does not matter about you satisfying yourself, you're really concerned about satisfying Christ, then there's not going to be anything moving you in reference to who you think you are, your pride, maybe your feelings, your emotions. You know, we get our feelings hurt, and then we just stop. Uh, no, no, no. None of these things move us. We stay faithful and steadfast unto the Lord. Now, why did he do that? Because he had a course to complete. He said he wanted to finish my course with joy and the ministry. He didn't say I just want to drudge through and just maybe get there and be grumpy on the way. He said he wanted to finish with joy. We ought to be excited. The longer you're saved, you ought to be happier you ought to be. Uh, the longer you're involved in ministry, the more excited you ought to be about ministry. You might not be able to do things you used to do when you are younger, but one thing you can do, you sure can be happy, amen? So we need to be joyful in the Lord. And then grace to share. That's why he says, oh, um, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And people do not understand grace. And uh, they think grace is them doing something to earn God's favor. But grace is gaining God's favor without doing anything at all. And Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, and we didn't deserve that. And then a, he said the final meaning. I, I always have moved in verse 25 because it says, And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. He knows he's come to the end. He knows those that are with him. Uh, you know, just thinking of the fact that uh, 
that if God would let you know that you're not going to be here any longer, uh, what would you often think about that? What would you say to people that you love? Hallelujah. Yeah, amen. Hallelujah is right. You'll be getting out of here. But, but what's the challenge you give to them? Uh, what, what is the encouragement that you give to them? I'm not, you're not going to see me anymore. God's taking me to heaven. I've got this ministry to fulfill, and I'm not concerned about what the adversaries are, uh, but I just want you to know that uh, you're a part of the kingdom. I thought it was interesting because he said, uh, whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. So that's people he was in ministry with, he traveled with, uh, and as they preach the gospel, I need to get off of that. I don't know if you're done. Verse 26 and 27, I entitled it Faithful Witness. Notice in verse 26 says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shown to declare unto you the counsel of God. And uh, so, Tommy, you want to give us some, some thoughts there? Yeah, this, this passage reminds me of, I think it's in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 3. And there's a it's a prophecy, it's like a warning yeah. that God gives to that God gives to Ezekiel to share. And basically it's a it's a story of a watchman, someone who's yeah. watching over a city, and his job is to make sure the enemy can't come in. But if he falls asleep on the job and he wakes up and the city's attacked and people die, the blood of those people is on him. Yeah. It's his responsibility to stop them, to warn them yeah. that the enemy is coming. And we have that same responsibility. We're we're set as Really, as a watch over Ocean County Baptist Church over Tom's River, we're supposed yeah. to be telling every person we come in contact with the gospel. The Apostle Paul says, I'm clean. My blood, my, there's no blood on my hands. I've told everyone I can about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The question that convicts me and really should convict all of us is, can the same be said of us? How, how many people have, in my life personally, I've failed to share the gospel with? Well, the Apostle Paul, that wasn't said of him. And so in our lives as, as Christians, make it a point, you know, sometimes it's a, a simple two second we pass by somebody. Well, hand them a track. Mm -hmm. Give them an invitation to church. Give them something that they can take the truth of the word of God with mm -hmm. so that we, we, get the opportunity to share the, we get the opportunity to share the gospel with them. So that one day when we get done with our life, we can say, I truly strive to share the gospel with every single person I possibly do. Amen. That's true. Yeah, I'm glad he remembered the chapter because I couldn't think of it. I knew it was going to be. I was like, I won't mention that. I don't know the chapter. But it, like he said, his ego talks about a watchman. And, you know, as he was saying, I thought to myself, you know, whose blood is on my hands? Mm -hmm. You know, what family member that I didn't tell that, you know, may have already, you know, passed on? And what you know, friend that I've had that at work maybe and now I'm out of that job and I never got to tell them? I think of a, a sobering story really is when I was at my job before this at NVR and there was. A young man, he was in his 20s, maybe 30s, and they called us in one day. They're like, they just brought out all the people on my section together, and they're like, uh, you know, the, the guy, the young man's name. He's like, yeah, he OD'd last night. Mm -hmm. And the day before that, he was talking to me, and he was like, yeah, I don't know. He was saying, they were not making fun of me, but he was surprised that I never curse and all the things that I don't do, and that I'm going to Bible college. And, you know, I don't, never really gave him the gospel. and. You know, we went to his funeral that next day, and I just remember looking into the, in the casket and knowing where he was and knowing that, you know, his blood is on my hands, that I had an opportunity and I didn't say anything. And I know I'm not the only one, but we have to realize that, you know, it's, it's of the utmost importance that we talk to people. And I just, one more story. I remember one time um, my mom and I were out soul winning, probably when I was like 16 or 17, and we knocked on the door, and it was like a younger guy, and he listened, and, you know, we even gave him the gospel, and he's like, no, I don't want to accept that, I don't want anything to do with that. And as we were walking away, I remember her saying, you know, he's going to see us again. He's going to see our faces, and he's going he's to say, man, I wish I listened. Amen. And, you know, that's a good thought, but I thought, you know, how many people are going to see me again and say, man, I wish they told me. Yeah. You know, I was good friends with this person. They were part of my family. Why didn't they ever tell me that this is... <laughs> this is this is important. I know that we try to tell our family, we try to tell our friends, but we get uh, it, like um, like Paul said, none of these things move me. Don't be moved by the fact that they may not like you anymore. It's worth it for them to not talk to you if you can give them the gospel just one time, or your families or your friends that you know say, oh, I don't want to lose those friends. They're they're my best friend, but if they're not saved, that is more important than being friends with them. Mm, amen. So I put down here a faithful witness because he has seized a hold of every opportunity. He didn't walk away from an opportunity to give the gospel out. And he shared every principle. 
He, and because in verse 7, he says, I'm not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And so we're to share the whole gospel, the whole counsel of God. Then in verse 28, I put down a powerful warning. He says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So uh, verse 28, you have something right Andrew? Yes, in verse 26, sorry. And take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. When I read that, I think of, you know, all the flock. Don't leave anybody out. Just because you're not best friends with this person doesn't mean you can't go up and encourage that person mm -hmm. or say, oh, they never say hi to me when I walk by them. It doesn't matter. So, you know, be a blessing to somebody. If God puts somebody in your heart to go to, go to that person and pray with them, pray for them. And, you know, I've, I've seen many times with this one person, we're not going to, you know, call them out by name. But a lot of times I just see them praying with somebody. You know, don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed to just say, hey, can I pray with you? Take mm -hmm. them aside and yeah. just, you know, that's a good thing for God's house to be a house of prayer and to, yeah. you know, the whole flock. Never, if you even now, I think to myself, who have I missed? You know, who who is somebody that I just really don't talk to enough and don't say hello to enough? That should be our goal. Is next Sunday or tonight? You know, to go to them and say, hey, you know, how's it going? I it, encourage them, pray for them, ask them, hey, what can I pray about? You know, mm -hmm. things like that. Don't leave anybody out. That because we as a church should be a, a group of believers, you know, loving on each other, praying for each other as a whole flock, not just oh, well, I have my friends and. It's okay to be best friends with somebody and not best friends with another person, but don't leave anybody else. Amen. Tommy? So, yeah, I think of the fact that um, there's not one person in the flock of God that he doesn't consider valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think about that, you know, you, may, you know, maybe you're struggling with doubt, with fear, with concern, you know. Maybe you're unsaved and you're like, man, I don't know anyone that truly loves or cares about me. Well... If, if you're a parent or if, you're, if you have family, think of the person you're closest to. Would you be willing to sacrifice that person for somebody who doesn't care about you? And the answer for most of us would be like, no, probably not. I love that person. I don't want to do that. Well, that's what God did for us. He let his own son shed his blood so that you could be welcomed into his family. And it's just, to me, that is just an, an awesome thing is that he purchased our salvation with the blood of his son. Mm-hmm. Just if you really think about it, it's just it's it's awe inspiring. It's convicting to realize that every single one of us that he purchases. So if you see someone that's down, or you see someone that's struggling, that's someone Christ died for. If you see someone that's unsaved going back to the preaching the gospel, he he shed his blood for that person, and so that soul is valuable to God. And so as a believer, if you see someone that you know that's struggling or that's down, or maybe that you have strife or conflict with. Well, he's valuable to God. That person's valuable. He or she's valuable to God. So make it a point to get it right. Make it a point to pray with that person if you see them. Because we're all part of that family of God. And so, you know, whatever whatever the situation may be, let's make it a point to keep watch over everyone. Because it, times are tough. Things are difficult. The world is a very difficult place. And we as believers really need to look out for each other and also look out for those that really need someone to come alongside them to love them. Amen. It was, verse 28 is an interesting verse because the Apostle Paul really is talking to the elders of the churches and uh, he's challenging them about the role that they're fulfilled as the pastor of the church and uh, he says take heed therefore unto yourselves so I put down a personal evaluation and if you're in a leader, position of leadership you need to be always evaluating yourself in reference to how you're overseeing the ministry that God has given you and it's not only personal evaluation, but I see corporate dedication in verse 28. He says, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. And so the corporate aspect of everyone together. And then I see Holy Spirit observation. This is a good outline for teaching and preaching for you. Amen. And uh, he says, which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. So the Holy Spirit is involved in this calling, empowering, and enabling us. Uh, to uh, continue to guide the ministry. And then in verse 28, I see a spiritual nutrition. It says, to feed the church of God. Uh, the greatest thing that the pastor or elder or whatever uh, in the church or a uh, Sunday school teacher, whatever the role may be in leadership in the church, the greatest thing that you can do in that role is to feed the church of God. Feed them the word of God. And, uh, and so it's, it's so much more important than 
you know, recreation, entertainment, and everything else. They need to know what the Word of God says. So spiritual nutrition. And then in verse 28, the last sentence there, blood washed salvation, uh, who uh, says, uh, which he had purchased with his own blood. And so thank the Lord that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for us. Well, real quick, just one minute here, not even that. Uh, verse 29 and 30, I put down this, a grievous attack. Notice in verse 29, Paul says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Uh, just a closing thought and warning here. Grievous attack. Paul said, I know this, that there's going to be an attack from the outside. We always expect an attack from the outside. But the sad thing is in verse 31, 30, I'm sorry, he talks about an attack from inside. And so uh, that's why he's challenging them to walk in the spirit. Don't let these things move you. Be faithful to the ministry God's called you to do uh, because of the fact there is always an enemy from the outside that's going to be attacking. There's always someone inside that will cause an attack to draw people unto himself. And so what a great warning he gives encouraging words that he gives to the believers uh, as he gets ready to go to Jerusalem. Amen. So uh, read through that passage and uh, pray about it, meditate on it, and see what else the Lord will give you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight. Go through this, these few verses. Uh, it's a blessing to just see Paul's zeal, his commitment, the power of God resting on him. A challenge that he gives us, help us, Lord, to meet those challenges. Help us to be a help to each other, uh, encouraging one another, praying for one another, and, and teaching and instructing one another, enjoying the grace of God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well,